and welcome to the second episode of Cross Country 101. My name is Andrew Hutchinson, and today we'll be exploring a simple question that has many intriguing historical implications. Every sport has its particular logo and insignia, and cross country running is no different. Why is the logo for cross country running important? It sheds light on attributes of the sport that few people know. Its use is ubiquitous, but its true origins are mysterious. In this episode, we'll be exploring the interesting historical influences that might have independently contributed to what is commonly accepted today. Here's an early example, a photograph from Michigan State University taken in 1921. Proof that this design has existed within the sport for over 100 years. Why is an arrow associated with the cross country running logo? There is no definitive answer as to the origin, but there are facts that illuminate how it could have come about and a great opportunity to separate truth from legend. Three possible origins exist to answer this question. The practical argument, the Native American argument, and the classical argument. We will explore all three in detail to shed light on this fascinating story. First, the practical argument. Hare and hounds originated in England, which required a unique course design with frequent offshoots, obstacles, and false trails. From the beginning, finding the correct route was vital, and arrows were used to indicate the path. But it was usually a trail laid with cable with a paper trail arrow laid if necessary. Examples of early cross-country clubs did not incorporate arrows. As you can see here, none of the original cross-country clubs from the middle of the 19th century in England had one in their logo. Some had stags, some had gates, shields, or geometric designs. Therefore, this arrow design for the sport undoubtedly came later. But as the sport of running out of bounds became more popular, the use of a paper laid trail fell out of fashion. Some venues prohibited it. Thus, the substituting of chalk for paper became more practical, especially in the forests and parklands where cross country was run. The leading hares would take chalk into the woods and leave arrows and markings upon the land. On some courses, physical arrows were attached to trees or signs to show the way. But the use of chalk persisted in urban areas, especially in American cities. A game called Chalk the Corner became especially popular. Four running youths would mark a trail on streets and sidewalks using chalk, and the following pack would check the arrows to find the intended route. There are examples of Chalk the Corner in American newspapers that span more than 50 years. Here are a few of them. 1867 in Boston, Massachusetts. She is the brightest eyed and merriest of all the merry little ones that play the famous game of Chalk Corners in and about Chestnut Street. Eighteen eighty-eight, Buffalo, New York. The chase is very similar to hounds and hares in Chalk the Corner, with which everyone is familiar. Eighteen ninety-five, Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. Chalk the Corner. This game, which is called Hare and Hounds in Other Cities, has been advanced to the dignity of a match between two Philadelphia schools. There's no reason why such a healthful sport should not find favor in Brooklyn, and the substitution here of chalk on the pavement for scattering bits of paper is to be commended. 1896, Waterloo, Iowa. In last night's paper, there was an item saying that Deputy Sheriff Smith traced chalk arrows on the sidewalk from the county jail to his home. It was supposed to be the work of tramps, but don't be alarmed because it was only the mark of some Eastside schoolboys playing chalk corners. 1903, Ottawa, Kansas. Children are playing chalk the corner and sheep pen down at night. It is spring. 1904, New York City, New York. Versions of hare and hounds like cops and robbers and chalk corners in which the scent is given by arrows marked on walls or pavements need no description. 1923, Charleston, West Virginia. Housewives awaken in the morning to find mysterious arrow chalk marks upon their pavements. The neighborhood gang has simply been indulging itself in the old, old game of hare and hounds, now called chalk and corners by Glidcombe youths. By the early 20th century, adult running clubs had picked up the game, and playing a form of chalk the corner was adopted as hashing, named so for the hash hound harriers who popularized it. As a leisure time activity, it became so popular that a few common icons were adopted by the game and used worldwide, including markings for checking the trail, as seen here. Arrows were also utilized in hashing, both to check the correct trail, but also to indicate whether a trail ran to a dead end or went beyond some type of obstruction. 's chase ended with the phrase on in and an arrow leading to the appropriate pub or determined endpoint. Might the cross country arrow have been adopted by popular pastimes like hashing and chalk the corner? It's the first of three likely origins. The second comes to us with the influence from Native American culture. 
In the early 19th century, America became fascinated with pedestrianism, long-distance running and walking competitions that often included a wagering element. Some of the first prize winners were Seneca Native Americans living in Buffalo. John Steeprock and Lewis Bennett, also known as Deerfoot, were two such examples. To satisfy audiences, American horse track owners and businessmen on the East Coast recruited these Native Americans to face international talent. In October 1844, at Beacon Racecourse in Hoboken, New Jersey, a race pitting American pedestrians against British pedestrians, all of them professionals, took place, which resulted in large, unrestrained crowds and an enthusiasm for the sport that lasted decades. On the West Coast, the indigenous peoples of what is now California lived peacefully for thousands of years. After the United States' victory in the Mexican-American War, an extensive effort began to document the vast new territory acquired in the Treaty of Guadalupe Hidalgo in 1848. Urban cities, such as San Francisco, insisted the privileged elite enjoy the preoccupations of gentlemen elsewhere, and the first athletic club in the United States was founded in San Francisco, the Olympic Athletic Club, in 1860. Even before they had a clubhouse, members of the Olympic Club and other local groups would run hare and hound cross-country races in nearby seaside communities, like this excerpt shows from 1890 from the nearby city of Sausalito. In line with this preoccupation with the sport, the Olympic Club founded a notoriously challenging cross-country race in 1904, called the Dipsy, which lays claim to being the oldest trail race in the United States. Surprising under the circumstances was the popularity of the event. Due to the nature of the trail in Marin County where the race took place, known locally as the Lone Tree Trail, named such by the Miwok tribe of Native Americans who inhabited the region, or perhaps inspired by historically long distance races in California, including so-called Indian foot races, in which California Native Americans competed over distances that might cross the state, the Olympic Athletic Club members who founded the Dipsy Cross Country Race adopted the moniker of the Dipsy Indians. The adoption of Indian mascots in sports, while not politically correct today, was interpreted differently at the turn of the century. As another example, nearby Stanford University publicized hare and hound meetings in the 1890s in their on-campus publication, The Sequoia, and they were known as the Indians until the 1950s. Aside from mascot affiliation, California was ahead of the curve when it came to organizing prep sports. In 1895, San Francisco created the Academic Athletic League, which supported football, track and field, and other sports. San Rafael High School provides hard evidence with the earliest documented photograph of their cross-country team from 1909, emblazoned across their chest as an unmistakable arrow. The classical argument is the third and final influence on where the cross-country arrow might have come from. The turn of the 20th century ushered in the age of modern athletics, but much of that design was modeled after what had been conducted in ancient Greece. Elements of the ancient Greek Olympic Games, including the Olympic flame, awarding of a laurel wreath, and structure of competition, were all integrated in the modern spectacle. As a cornerstone of the education movement, in both public and private settings, students were all instructed on the ancient Greek and Roman myths to foster an appreciation for Western history. It was no surprise, then, to find ancient Greek iconography as part of the logos for some of the most influential athletic clubs in both England and the United States. While the original cross-country clubs in England did not incorporate arrows, in 1863, the London Athletic Club was founded and utilized the caduceus, staff with snakes, and winged ptosis, wide-brimmed hat, of Hermes within the iconography of its logo. In 1868, the New York Athletic Club followed, literally modeled after the London Athletic Club, and in homage, they used the Tolaria, winged sandals, and olive branch wreath in their respective logo. The Greek god Hermes was a protector of youth. Appointed the official messenger of Mount Olympus by Zeus himself, Hermes came to symbolize the crossing of boundaries as a guide between the two realms of gods and humanity. He was the half-brother of Artemis and Apollo, and was the patron god of athletics. He was the first god to organize athletic games in order to develop the physical abilities of his protégés. Hermes established the events pertaining to the Palestra. In several ancient Greek cities, such as Athens and Crete, young men worshipped Hermes through celebrations and athletic contests in his honor. Other icons, such as the winged fist of the Irish American Athletic Club, or the unicorn, or the Boston Athletic Association, furthered this classical influence. It was not difficult to see how the Greek goddess Artemis, who was the patron Greek goddess of the hunt, of the wild land, and of animals, might lend her bow and arrow, fashioned by the Cyclops, to the logo of cross-country running. In the ancient Greek city of Brauron, Scenes of ritual depicted on pieces of pottery showed young women running in foot races in honor of Artemis as part of a coming-of-age ceremony. 
As goddess of the wilds, her cult marked transitions between the wild and the civilized, between the savage world of wild animals and the sophisticated world of humans. Might it have been Artemis? Modern icons representing the winged shoe and arrow persist today within the sport. That brings us back to Michigan more than 100 years ago, where in addition to Michigan State and their use of the logo, we find an early entry about Detroit high schools in the sport dating back to 1911. Here, an excerpt reads at the bottom of the page, at the end of the season the race was held, in which the first five to finish were awarded an orange ECCC script monogram, a black arrow extending through. Whether it was adopted from a practical directional design element, a tribute to Native American culture, or from the influence of classical Greek music, we may never know for sure. Only that this icon within cross-country will continue to reign supreme as long as the sport is practiced.